there is no right or wrong when our goals are general health. If your end goal is to get these benefits of exercise for your ADHD brain, then I would say, yeah, that cardio is awesome. And some weight training is really good, especially if we know that it's going to help you go to sleep at night or help you kind of get in there. And of course, overall health. And one of the things that we know about longevity in men and women is the more muscle mass we have on us, the longer we're going to live. They've done studies on the elderly, and there's a direct correlation between the size of their legs of muscle and their risk of any kind of heart disease. ADHD Rewired, episode 219. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. Hey, everyone. If you've been listening for a while, you might recall my interview last November with Brett Smith called Boredom and Grace. It was episode 194. Brett's a real estate agent, and when he was on the podcast, he talked with me about his struggle with changing jobs every 18 months. Well, a few months after our interview, he scheduled a registration interview with me and ended up joining our winter coaching group. And this was his experience. So I've been in, I don't know, like maybe half a dozen group coaching programs. So in real estate, there's like a gazillion group coaching programs you can be in. And I will say this is the most organized, valuable group coaching program I've ever been a part of by a mile. I mean, there's such a gap between this and even the second best group coaching program. The level of organization, the level of thought, and the just the structure that you put into it, pretty spectacular. Holy shit. It's been way beyond my expectations. I just really appreciate that. It's so clear to me now, like just where I'm in my life, you've got to find a tribe. And this is one of the tribes that I identify with 100%. It's awesome. My name is Brett Smith. I'm a real estate broker in Austin, Texas. I kind of came to my ADHD diagnosis as, as an adult through some career challenges and sort of changing jobs every 18 months. And I realized that as I get older and as I get through different phases of my life, that the stakes become higher. So the, the impact of some of the challenges with ADHD become bigger. There's bigger stakes every time. And so I decided to get really serious about it. And I felt like joining this group would be a good framework for me to approach some of my tendencies to change jobs on a regular basis and sort of figure out how to manage through that. I think one of my biggest takeaways is that externalizing the structure for my life is essential. It's not just a good idea. It's not just sort of interesting. It's I literally just won't get things done unless I externalize a lot of the timelines and accountabilities and structure. I can design the best plan, but I won't execute it unless I've got some kind of external structure built around me. This group helped me to shift my understanding from that being a best practice or a good idea to being non-negotiable and essential. One of the things that's been useful for me is just to be a part of a group of other people that understand why this is a challenge and what's uniquely hard about it. Because you just realize that other people have the sort of exact same flavor of challenges in their lives that, that you experience that nobody else around these seems to really understand or appreciate. One of the things that I would say to somebody who hasn't joined this group is you don't know yet what you don't know. You will discover things about yourself and things about ADHD that you think you understand now, but you don't fully comprehend in a way that could actually move the needle in your life. And this is an opportunity to get, I think, a deeper, more meaningful understanding of some of the kind of core principles that right now you probably don't have your hands around and that you could have your hands around if you gave it a little more structure. Holy shit, it's been way beyond my expectations. There are only four more registration days between now and May 31st. You have this Tuesday and Thursday and next Tuesday and Thursday. And that's it. We're over 50% full as of this recording on Thursday, May 17th. We only have 11 spots left. We're only doing two sections this summer. So spots will go fast. Our summer intensives begin Monday, July 9th and meet every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through August 31st. If you're ready to grow, then go to coachingrewired.com to schedule your registration interview. To learn more and to reserve your registration interview time with me, go to coaching 
rewired.com. And if you can't do it now, hit pause and set a reminder to go to coachingrewired.com. Last time, coachingrewired.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from listeners like Josh R. and Audrey T., who recently showed their support with a monthly contribution over at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. I want you to think about how much you value this podcast. Do you listen every week? Do you recommend it to your family and friends? Does everyone in your family know who I am? Have you been thinking of getting an ADHD Rewired tattoo? If you are, I want to remind you that's really permanent. Instead, support this podcast by becoming a patron. Your monthly contribution lets me know you value this podcast, the community, and everything else we do. Plus, unlike a tattoo, if you change your mind in the future, you can just stop contributing at any time. Go to patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. And did you know that it costs about $450 to $500 per month to produce this podcast, which is available to you for free? But maybe you're thinking, oh, but Eric, you advertise your coaching group, so you're already making money. Why should I support you on Patreon? And to that, I'd say you don't have to. It really is completely voluntary and you'll keep getting the podcast, whether you become a patron or not. And yes, you can get access to the cool perks, but I don't think that most patrons become patrons for the perks. If you've been listening for a while, or maybe you even recently discovered ADHD Rewired and you find the conversations you hear each week comforting, inspiring, engaging, and you find that your day or week just a little bit better because of something you heard on the podcast, how much is that worth to you? A buck? Five bucks? 20 bucks? All amounts are welcome and really appreciated. And if you really are not able to support us financially, you can always support us by leaving an honest rating and review over on Apple Podcasts and by telling a friend or loved one about the podcast and then get them to become a patron. To become a patron, go to patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E. O N. That's patreon.com slash ADHD rewired. And thanks. Hey everyone, I just want to remind you that we are still looking for guests. Let me help you tell your story. I'm especially interested in couples where one or both of you have ADHD and you're willing to come on the podcast together. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast and click the Be a Guest tab at the top of the page Then schedule a 15 minute pre interview. And if you're in the Chicago area, I'd love to record it with you in the ADHD Rewired studios in Glenview. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast and click the Be a Guest tab at the top of the page and schedule a 15 minute pre interview. Hope to talk to you soon. Thanks. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am uh, glad to have back on the podcast, Gabriel Villarreal. Get it on the first take. Nailed it. All right. <laughs> so uh, Gabriel is a resident in counseling, soon to be a licensed practicing counselor. He owns a part-time practice, ADHD counseling uh, in Roanoke Valley. How to do on that? Roanoke. Roanoke. Yeah. Okay. So it's not... Roanoke's Roanoke, uh, <laughs> where he helps children and adults manage and master their ADHD superpowers. Additionally, he owns Lost Boys Strength and Conditioning and is the host of Informed Consent, a weekly podcast supporting incoming clinicians in the mental health field. So, Gabriel, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Eric. I appreciate it. So when you were last on, you were sort of in this, I think, a, a state of lots of transitions and development of the business. Um, yep. where, where are you at right now with things? Right now, um, the practice has grown. I've gotten, gotten more exposure thanks to your podcast and to a few other interviews that I've done. And um, that's been... So the practice has only been open actually um, for a year and uh, four months. So we're slowly gaining traction. I've transitioned almost completely out of my my part-time community mental health job. I just kind of sub for them if, you know, they get, you know, they need a break or they're going on vacation. And then I'm running my gym probably about five hours, five hours a day, five days a week. 
I've added some new things. Um, you and I spoke, I added a class for, for children with ADHD specifically, and which I guess we're going to talk a lot about exercise and ADHD. So that's, you'll find out why I started that class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what I want to say is that, that, so today's conversation, you know, uh, for, for listeners of the show who have, uh, uh, listened for a while, know that, that I have a pretty strong sort of filter on who I, who I bring on the show and what topics, um, you know, we talk about. So we're going to be talking a lot today about diet and exercise and, um, you know, and I always have some caution bringing, uh, uh, having full on episodes around these topics because I want to br- bring it in from a science-based perspective. And, you know, for, you know, I'm not an expert in nutrition by any means, nor, nor am I in, in exercise. All I know, all I know that it's really important for, for us to exercise, Right. I know it's, it feels like the state of science, especially around nutrition is constantly changing and it's not just evolving. It's like, no, the thing we thought before it was good for you, it turns out it was bad for you. And this is not what's good for you. And then like rinse and repeat. Right. right. So what, what we're going to talk about today is I would say it's, I guess what we, what Gabriel knows is out there. And, uh, and I'm going to ask questions for my own curiosity. So, um, for for those of you who like the really really intense strong science oriented shows, um, just I want to just have that caveat that some of the science out here may be emerging, maybe like in an area where we just need to study it. So we're just going to have this conversation around uh, different areas of, of diet, different areas of exercise, and I'm probably going to ask some questions selfishly for myself to to uh, to talk about some of this. So um, l- where do you want to begin here? Maybe a good place to begin is maybe to give people some comfort is is an explanation of where I'm coming from as far as education and things like that. Um, I have my master's degree in clinical mental health, and I don't know how much I shared about this on the first podcast that we did. So I apologize if it's redundant. Um, it's okay. I don't remember but, either, so I don't want to stick my cool. listeners to <laughs> <laughs> um, So uh, my first semester of graduate school, I decided to impulsively train for a half marathon. And, um, I absolutely loved the training and, uh, it, it kept me very regimented in graduate school, especially in that first semester where you're unsure of yourself. You don't know what's going to be required of you. You're scared of your teachers and, and the assignments that they give. Um, but having that routine of, okay, I need to run in between these classes. I need to run when I get up or when I get home, um, really completely gave me a huge leg up in comparison to my peers. Um, I can recall the vast majority of my cohort in graduate school. I recall all of them crying at some point that first semester. And I was the only one that was kind of like even keel. And that's not, not because I'm super macho, but because I was dialing in or beginning my journey of understanding nutrition and and exercise. And it kind of clicked in December uh, after that first semester that I was like, you know, everyone's falling apart and, and I'm, I'm doing fine. And so I, it was then that I was like, these two things need to be connected. Um, and so I finished graduate school with the full intention of once graduate school is done, um, I will begin my education on exercise, um, and, uh, strength conditioning. And I did that. So my first job out of graduate school was at emergency services, which is a job where you kind of just sit until shit hits the fan. And then, um, so there's a lot of sitting around. So I just consumed books and podcasts from, from the experts, um, everywhere that I could, uh, cause you have a lot of downtime. Some days I'd work 12 hours and not do anything, but listen to these podcasts and read these books. And then I got my strength and conditioning certification. Um, a couple months later, I opened my gym and uh didn't stop learning i kept like the rabbit hole is very deep as you kind of said which is why we don't have any current any current hard data cuz it's constantly evolving and constantly changing why why do you think that is that it's constantly changing that like it's it seems yeah that it's constantly changing is like there are too many variables like what what is it man so there's um oh, i'll try not to go down this rabbit hole but i'm really excited because um the my gym is affiliated with Mash Elite Performance, and Mash Elite Performance is the gym that is uh, currently training all of the Olympic hopefuls uh, in Olympic weightlifting. Um, so I'm very lucky and fortunate in that I have kind of a connection to these elite athletes, and there is a small budding research with these athletes of what makes them different physiologically and in their training and things like that. And uh, the last that I heard, that some of the studies that they're doing with them have never been done ever before. A caveat to that is 
they're including females. So this is research that we have never, ever, ever, ever had um, in the history of ever. Most of the research that we have in strength and conditioning was done by the Russians. And um, if you've watched Rocky IV, you know that um, the Russians were, or actually, if you've paid attention to the Olympics, you know that they are still um, enhanced. So that data is heavily skewed. And so there's not a lot of money in it in Russia is because it's, it's state funded. Um, in the government, these athletes, I mean, the United States, that's not the case, um, especially in Olympic weightlifting. It's kind of like, I hope you can find a good, hopefully you can find a good coach. There's probably a handful of good Olympic weightlifting coaches out there. Um, but in order to pay them or, or move to them, that's, that's a big shift. Um, so I think that's, that contributes to why, the research is not there's not enough. money in it there's, no there's not there's not and and of the handful of people look around in the, in the united states we don't really have a an issue of people wanting to get stronger and healthier um it's actually the exact op- opposite so it's like why are we going to put money in something that people clearly don't care about right i know in uh i remember in, in john rady's book uh spark talks about these uh this this thing that they know about that has all these benefits um you know and so who, who wouldn't want this thing, right? And this thing is, is exercise, right? Where they were comparing that to, to different medications, right? And, and, sh- and showing that uh, intense cardiovascular exercise can have uh, just as, if not even a little bit more benefit than some of like the, the SSRI medications. Yeah. And it's, and it's dependent upon obviously the individual and the type of exercise. Um, and unfortunately, to your point, the vast majority of this um, research has only been done on cardiovascular work. Um, but what if you're someone like me to finish my story about the half marathon who got three, three miles into the half marathon and was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is dumb. <laughs> I want to go home. Um, Did you yeah, finish? it was awful. Yeah, I finished. Um, but it was only because I paid and I had trained for so long. Otherwise, if someone else had paid the entrance fee, I probably would have been like, I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. I finished. I had a good time. And then I kind of, I did some other stuff and then I found lifting. But unfortunately, yeah, the research has only been done, uh, like you and I said before we hit record, on children. And it was cardiovascular. And that's, people always ask me why. And I think that it's primarily because you can put someone on a treadmill and, um, throw whatever you need on them to track their, their physiology and chemicals. And they don't have to, that's easy. That's simple. Uh, there's, there's, they're in a stationary spot running on a treadmill. So, um, unfortunately that's what we have. It is different for, we can jump into this real quick. It is different for men and women. Um, if you, well, given the data, it's actually different for boys and girls. There's not a whole lot of data on men and women. Um, so a lot of the research has only been done with kids. Uh, so for, for boys, we, if you want these neurological benefits um, for boys that are akin to the stimulant medications and things like that, they need to be at a max heart rate. Uh, they need to get to that threshold. When they get to that threshold, that dopamine, that norepinephrine, and that BDNF, uh, which isn't completely applicable to ADHD, but it's super important. When they hit that threshold, that's when those chemicals are produced. Can you, uh, for, for any acronym or thing that you use for, for listeners who aren't in, uh, in the know, will you explain what it is? Sure, sure, sure. Um, BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic factor. Um, and the, the long and short of that is it's basically miracle growth for the brain. That's what uh, John already like says. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so um, we can think of it as if we have only one road to work, uh, to get to work, excuse me, then what BDNF does is it creates more roads to get to work. Um, So that's super important, especially if you're someone that's depressed or anxious or have maybe some sort of PTSD, because now you have multiple ways uh, and hopefully infinite ways by which to cope with something as opposed to, you know, if you're an alcoholic and you get stressed, you go to the drink um, and that's kind of your only way to cope. But if you have this BDNF pumping in your brain, road signs or exits, new exits begin to appear. So, but the, the dopamine and the, and the norepinephrine are, are really what um, stimulant meds um, for ADHDers target. Um, we, they, they upregulate the dopamine being produced. That way we can be more motivated and more driven and more um, have more stick to uh, And the norepinephrine um, helps regulate our, um, our emotions and how we react to things. So what exercise does is when we hit this threshold, 
more of that is produced, more of those chemicals are produced, which kind of gives us a baseline and baseline being a baseline for a neurotypical person where we're really even keeled and where we're just on almost. And before I forget, so max heart rate for boys and for girls, it's somewhere between 60 and 75% of max heart rate. So really quickly, if you have a son or daughter, 220 minus their age, and that's their max heart rate. Okay. So if you have a 10 year old boy, two to 10 is their max heart rate. So they need to be up there. Um, if you have a 10 year old girl, um, it's two to 60%, 60 to 75% of two ten. So if, uh, as for, for listeners, uh, if you just heard all those numbers and your, your brain just went, wah, 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 <laughs> me too. <laughs> so, um, I, if, that, if that's a helpful number for us to understand, to think that you can, uh, maybe give me some of that information and I can put it on my, my website, yes. my, my brain Absolutely. does a math, does a math real well. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I was actually internally proud of myself that I was able to uh, subtract 10 from 220. <laughs> I would be proud too. <laughs> All right. So we're looking at, at, at the, the some research about the, uh, you know, between uh, boys and girls, you're, you're extrapolating that for men and women uh, for cardiovascular exercise mm -hmm. that, that creates uh, the, the miracle grow for new neural connections uh, in mm -hmm. the brain. All right. So, what about weightlifting? So that's, yeah, so there's no research. <laughs> and, um, anecdotally, uh, and, and when we talk about weightlifting, I'll, I'll simplify it in case there's anyone in the know or that's confused. I'll, I'll define weight training as the stuff that you see at the global gym of guys just grabbing dumbbells and doing curls um, and maybe doing some, some other stuff with some, some dumbbells. Um, when I refer, when I refer to weightlifting, I'm talking about um, back squatting, bench pressing, deadlifting, doing the he heavy lifts uh, and working towards those things. And there's a, there's a big difference in there, especially when we talk about getting us to some sort of max heart rate. Doing some bicep curls, doing three sets of 10 of bicep curls um, is not really going to push you to that max heart rate unless you're really, really, really out of shape. However, doing a uh, three by three, three sets by 10 reps of a heavy back squat, you're going to get your heart rate there. Um, and that's a lot of the work that I do. I do Does a the lot time of in between sets matter as well. I would imagine. Um, well, for your goals, yes, it can. Um, so I would say if you want to keep that heart rate up and if your purposes are to approach that heart rate, then yeah, I would limit the rest period. That way you don't have as much time to recover and your heart rate doesn't have as much time to come down. But that is purely for a, a, um, a heart rate goal. And I have to get into to the other reasons why you would wait longer or anything like that. Um, but yeah, if you were... Um, wanted to train these lifts and you wanted to get strong, that would be my recommendation is you need to be squatting, deadlifting and bench pressing heavy, cutting down the rest periods, doing a, a of course, moderate intensity um, with a good form. Because <laughs> if you break, then your, your ability to exercise goes out the window, but limiting that rest period so your heart rate can stay high. And that way you're getting the benefits of these neurochemicals that are being dumped as you hit these thresholds. Okay. Um so I actually, I have a few questions, I guess, for just for myself, since I, you know, I have your attention. So I'm going to pick your brain for my own benefit. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, this will help listeners too. Um, so I have been, um, I've been pretty good about my, my exercise routine probably since uh, I, I kind of fell off a bit for a while. But since January, I've been, I've been going to the gym about uh, three to four times a week. And actually, as of recently, I'm at like four, about four times a week. And then I'll do uh, like some sit-ups, push-ups, um, put that at home. And so about a month or two ago, I was listening to an audio book called, I think it's called, uh, sleep smarter or something like that. And, and in there, um, I'm sure if my listeners would like me to actually give them the specific recommendation. <laughs> um, so I, at the break, I'll, I'll look it up on my phone. Um, so in there, they, they were talking about that weightlifting, Early in the morning, so they because I guess there was a study that they did where they compared people that did it from like at around nine a.m., people that did it around like two a two p.m., and then people that did it in the like the later part of the evening, and the impact on on sleep. And so the people mm -hmm. that lift weights early in the morning has there's a better impact on sleep as compared to um, the the latter two latter two groups. So. Mm -hmm. As soon as I heard that weightlifting has a benefit for sleep, 
I was like, okay, I'm gonna start weightlifting. I haven't done weightlifting probably probably since high school, maybe. Uh, I mean, I was when I was in high school, I played football. When I say play, I mean like I was the, I was like the prep team that never got time on the field. Um, the position was left out. Um, and keep in mind, I didn't know I had ADHD at that time. And you know, like I'm I'm not really that athletic of a person. I just like my, the, the the version of myself that I want to like be is, but I'm not really right. But I was pretty strong. I was in pretty good shape, right? Um, and so I was I was. You know, I was lifting a lot of weight. I, I, probably at that time, I I was weighing two hundred and fifty pounds, and it wasn't all waistline. Um, so this is so now, like probably fifteen, man, twenty years later. How old am I? Thirty seven. You know, I this is the first time again I've been lifting weights for a lot of the last two months or so, and I'm starting to to notice. You know, I'm, I'm you know. I'm in, the games. I'm, I'm in the bathroom. I'm brushing my teeth, and I I take a double. You know, I have to take a double take. I'm like, that's muscle on my arm, right? <laughs> and, and so I'm just sort of I'm in curious now that I'm starting to to get in the the rhythm of some of this. Like, what could I be doing to sort of um, you know maximize some of my my results? What I'm doing now is I, I always use cardio. Um, uh-huh. So I usually do between thirty to to, up to sometimes up to an hour, and then I'll do about fifteen to twenty minutes of of lifting. Is that a, is that a thing that, how am I doing with that? Is that <laughs> there's, and, and here's, here's my caveat to probably everything else we're going to talk about for the rest of the podcast. There is no, there is no right or wrong when our goals are general health. Okay. If you were to say, I'm going to do, this is my program and I'm going to get freaking jacked by summertime. I'd say it's not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll, email you a pro- I'll email you a program and we'll get you on track. It depends on what your, what your end goal is. If your end goal is to get these benefits of exercise for your ADHD brain, then I would say, yeah, that cardio is awesome. And some weight training is really good, especially if we know that it's going to help you go to sleep at night or help you kind of get in there. And of course, overall health, um, you said you're in your late um, 30s. One of the things that we know is for men in their late 30s, they're, they're, um, testosterone dips, um, which it's already done. And, um, and your ability to create and keep muscle goes down too. So, oh, crap. <laughs> here's, so here's the thing. So, okay. And this is, this is how I, I always think about the long game um, in my life and in my, my lifters at my gym, their lives too, is I have a few guys that are in mid fifties and it's like, look, your testosterone's down. Um, you're overweight. We need to put muscle on you because this next half of your life, you're going, to, it's going to be a fight to keep any muscle. Okay. And one of the things that we know about longevity in men and women is the more muscle mass we have on us, the, the longer we're going to live. Uh, they've done studies on, um, on the elderly and there's a direct correlation between the size of our, of their legs of muscle and their risk of any kind of heart uh, disease at all. Um, so for me, and thinking about your overall long-term health, I would say, yeah, keep doing that because you need muscle to, to do things for the rest of your life and you need that cardio as well because it's going to help with these, this ADHD thing. And let me throw a really big monkey wrench um, in your story is I don't do any cardio at all. <laughs> I don't get on a treadmill. I don't go for a run. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll drag a sled or, or push a prowler, um, but it's usually just the heavy lifts. So take that as, as, as you will. But it all depends on everybody. You know, I, I, I know I've been doing this long enough to know that I can, I get those benefits from the lifting that I do. Um, mind you, I do it six days a week and it's been, I've been doing six days, six to seven days a week for the last, since my gym has been open. So for almost three years. So I know that this works for me, you know, now if you were to give me the gold, the gold standard, they, they came out with research and said, Nope, this is the best thing to do is you need to go run, um, out on a treadmill and you need to be at this mile per hour for your weight, for your height. And you need to hold that, uh, that pace for 30 minutes. I would hate it. And I would, I would not get the benefits. There is a correlation and it's, and it's all anecdotal from the elite lifters that I was telling you about. If they're not enjoying it and they're not having fun, it could be the greatest program ever and they won't put on size. They won't get any stronger and their, their technique won't get any better either. So there's a huge, there's a lot to add for, are you enjoying it? No, it, it's amazing. There was um, uh, like 
Because, you know, it's during the wintertime in the Chicago area. I'm I'm going to the gym and I'm on a lot of the, the machines. You know, it's like a, hard to go nowhere. Right. <laughs> and typically I am OK because I'm either listening to an audiobook or a podcast or uh, even sometimes watching a show. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm so my mind's sort of distracted from what I'm doing. And uh, I was actually uh, not that long ago, I was uh, binging on the Harry Potter series. And like I got some of the like the longest like I was did a couple of workouts. So I was listening that I was I was doing it for over an hour. And like and that was, you know, that had surpassed my previous kind of high because I was so engrossed in the book um, that. And so for me, it was that was great. And um, the other day I was having uh, I was I was at the gym and I was at having issues with my phone and so I didn't have anything to listen to and I was like eight minutes in and I was like oh my god how am I how am I gonna get through this workout like I I, I gave in and plugged in the the my head's phone to whatever the head on at the the, the gym um, uh -huh. which, which annoys you because it's usually news and I'm like oh, I want to I want to de-stress like not get stressed right, right. Um, I I on the weekends if I ever go there I'm like can you like put on like the cooking channel or something because like, there's something that's like somewhat satisfying about working out watching people make cupcakes <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. so but so there's a thing a lot if, if you don't enjoy if you're resisting it i mean it's, it's just it's how how easy working out feels when i'm my brain's engaged doing something else and how hard it feels when i'm like oh, i don't want to do this anymore yeah and let me let me say two things to that first if you like that and and part of me wishes i i still was a runner or still ran a little bit because there's an amazing app that I used when I was training that I don't do anymore. And it has taken off and it's huge. It's called zombies run. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've ever done it or listened I to it. Done it, but it I, but I've heard fantastic. about it. It is fantastic. Even when they first launched it, I bought it when they first launched it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a full cast. Um, the audio has changed depending on um, your, the distance you're running so that you can get the full story or quote unquote yeah, episode. Explain, explain the app. It's basically you, you are a quote unquote runner. And um, the, this is it's during the zombie apocalypse and runners are like couriers from different towns or different um, settlements where um, they're safe against the zombies your job or every run that you go on is a new episode where something has happened. And so you are the runner and you have a headset on your earphones and the people of these different townships are talking to you. Um, and as you're going, uh, some of your, your courier jobs, um, are elements of this grand story of what's going on. And so it all kind of unravels this big story. And I think in the very first series, you kind of figure out how this zombie outbreak started. Um, and it's completely fascinating. And it's really cool because you can, you can add in um, zombie sound effects. So if your pace isn't what it needs to be or what you want it to be, you can start hearing like, <laughs> like zombies coming. It is a fantastic app. Does um, it only work for I, running outside or it, can you do... No, uh -uh. You can put on a treadmill and go. Okay. Um, and what about um, cycling? yeah, yeah, I don't, it's, it's not dependent. It's just, um, I think the setting is like duration. So how long are you going to run? Um, and you could say, I'm going to run for this long. And so then the audio has changed or the, the length of, um, the audio changes. And it that just means it spaces out between each, uh, um, like township quote unquote calling you. Um, it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> when I went, I was a runner so I could, so I could listen to it. Um, but I think it, it may have gotten picked up by audible. Um, but they do have their own app on their, on audible channels. But the other thing I was going to say, so I did a seminar not too long ago with the music therapist. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was, um, that she said that when we listen to music, um, our, our perceived effort drops or music that we like our perceived effort drops by like 15%. Um, so, if we are working out and it's, and it's hard um, or we're having a hard time getting going. And sometimes I do this still, even though I own a gym and I have speakers, um, I will put in headphones and say, I need to block everything out and, you know, get onto this bar. Um, so I would encourage your listeners to find, definitely find something they listen to. Um, they like listening to, excuse me, be it music or those podcasts or those audiobooks. And if you're really exerting a lot of force, find some good music um, because 15% of exertion is huge. It's a huge margin. So yeah, those are my two points to what you're talking about. Well, I know for, uh, for, for my own son, who's, who's six, when we're, we're trying to get him to get dressed in the morning, we put on, mm -hmm. the, we put on the Rocky theme song. Yeah. 
that's awesome. You know, there's, there's so much to, to, to how music moves us, right? And if you, and as an aside, if you, if you wanted to, and I'll send it to you. Um, so I did that seminar with the music therapist and I actually, I recorded it and I transcribed it um, and I made it into an ebook. So I will send that uh, ebook to you so you can include it in the link and your list and can read that. Um, and it's filled with good um, like tips and ideas like that um, for, you know, for ADHDers. And I mentioned uh, a little bit ago that I would uh, uh, find the, uh, I wanted to give the, the actual name of that book I was referring to. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That's a win that I didn't forget. Um, it's called <laughs> Sleep Smarter, 21 Essential Stir. Then it gets cut off. So I'm, I'm assuming that strategies is by Sarah Gottfried, uh, MD. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah, it was, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of really uh, interesting things in there. I'm always looking for stuff that's going to help me with sleep. That's like my, one of my oh, biggest challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting because that was one of the, the biggest things that I heard from my, the ADHD kids class that I have, that was one of the biggest things, um, that everyone or most of the parents reported. It wasn't that homework was super easy. It wasn't, they were more agreeable. It was when I tell him it's time for bed on the days that he works out, he says, okay. Yeah, I know for sure. I, I, I know, especially on days where I know I need to wake up early the next day. I have to have, mm -hmm. early, like I, I try to push it at the gym, uh, cause I, I know it'll help. Yeah. Me. Good for you. Yeah. You have to do it. And I think knowing that that information about yourself is really what makes the difference is knowing what am I going to, how am I going to be successful? Yeah. The, the other thing I want to mention too about exercise, and then we're going to go into a, a break here. You know, so I, for as long as I can remember, I, I dealt with uh, seasonal affective disorder and usually mm -hmm. right around March, it's, mm -hmm. it shows up like every year. And, and it seems like I, I forget that it comes every year and it's, you know, <laughs> I'm in like a, like a heap of tears. I like, talking to my wife. I'm like, I don't know. I just feel so miserable. And it's like, Oh yeah, it's March. That's why I feel this way. Right. Uh -huh. And so I was talking to a, a friend and I was telling her that, that like, I sort of felt it coming. This was like end of February. And, and she goes, didn't you tell me that usually every March, like you, so I'm like, oh, you're right. And so like, as soon as you said that, that's when I increased my, my, both the intensity of my workouts at the gym. And I was, I started going an extra day. It, I really believe that it's, it really, uh, kept the depression away. I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think, um, two things Just put, go into your Google calendar, if you use Google calendar, set alarm yes. for February 20th. Yes. Say, Yo, dude, it's already done. It's already done. <laughs> and the funny thing was that when I, I could have sworn that I had done this last year, right? Cause it's Maybe like, only one recurring event. <laughs> no, I mean, cause I do a lot of those kinds of things in my calendar, like those things that like I keep like learning the lesson over and over again. I'm like, uh -huh. okay, it's is now predictable. Put it in the calendar. Right. So yeah, uh -huh. no, absolutely. Good for you. And, and the other thing that I was going to say is, um, and this is probably one of the most important pieces, especially if, if one of your listeners is a parent of an ADHD or is um, the chronic exerciser. So the person that, that exercises kind of like I do for, for consistently for years. So we know that when we exercise, our ability to um, produce dopamine and norepinephrine is increased. So I like to think that is like turning on the faucet. But for the chronic exerciser, that happens as well. However, we begin to have a new baseline of how much dopamine and norepinephrine that we need. Um, so what that looks like is it's not so much that the faucets are being turned on, which they already are, but it's there are more hoses by which the dopamine and norepinephrine are produced. So we are getting more of it. And so that there's more. So we need less to do the same things as before. So I would say it's it may be a thing of March is coming. So in January, in December, I need to ramp these things up. I have a huge buffer. Um, you know, it's all anecdotal in, in Rady's book, Spark, but he, you know, he begs the question, how long of chronic exercise do we need to do before? Um, and he, he explicitly says, it may, for some of us, it may not be medication. We don't need it anymore. But for some of us is, can we titrate down that medication? Can we, you know, take a little bit less off because we're a chronic exerciser now? And of course, that's 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 an individual case by case, but um, it's something to think about. It's it's absolutely worth thinking about. Yeah, I, I view uh, exercise. It's it's like adding the the uh, the turbo booster to my medication. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it, it by definition, everything that we just talked about, it is a secondary medica medication. 
Um, but yeah, good for you. And I know that uh, some people call, uh, you know, food medicine as well. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, as I said that, like, did that really come out of my mouth? It, I, it did. So we're going to talk about that after the break. We'll be right back. Hey there, ADHD Rewired listeners. I want to ask you something. What's that one thing that you keep thinking about, but you really haven't done much about? Does it feel too overwhelming? Maybe you're not sure where to start. Maybe you're stuck in the muck of perfectionism or you're frozen by the fear of failure. Maybe you really do have too many balls in the air. What if that could all change? What if you could really learn to see time differently? So you're not constantly chasing your tail and putting out fires due to your time blindness. What if you actually began to put your own needs, your goals, and your priorities first and learned how to do so without feeling guilty and without feeling like you're being selfish? Because doing so would allow you to show up in the world as your best self. What if you could let go? of what you think you're supposed to be and embrace the creative, intuitive, brilliant badass that you are. You could turn these what ifs into what is with ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups. As of May 17, 2018, our summer sessions are 54% full. And this summer, I'm only offering two sections. So as of May 17th, we only have six spots left in section one and only five in section two. As of today, there are only four more days to register. You have this Tuesday and Thursday and next Tuesday and Thursday. Registration ends May 31st. Our summer intensives run July 9th through August 31st. Meetings are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and it's all virtual using Zoom video conferencing, so you can join us from the comfort of your own home or office. Registration is by appointment only, and same-day appointments may be available, but don't wait. To learn more and to see real-time availability and to schedule your registration interview, go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Are you looking for a great way to feel connected to the ADHD community? Want to get your burning questions answered? You want this all for free? Then join me along with a host of the ADHD Essentials Podcast, Brendan Mahan, every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern for ADHD Rewired's live Q&A. To register, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. All right. So uh, we we're back from the commercial break. So I'm hoping that gave you some food for thought. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. All right. Uh, so let's talk about nutrition and food, and because uh, you know, there's there's so many different fad, you know, diets or, or so you know. So I'm always like, whenever it comes to food, I'm like, put into your body stuff, see how you feel, <laughs> and if you feel <laughs> like crap, stop eating that thing, right? right. Like, but that's my approach. That's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. um Talk to me a little bit about, about your, like how you look at nutrition. Now you do some things, you do paleo, I think you said, maybe. No? So <laughs> I, I, I transitioned to um, the Bulletproof Diet back in November. Um, and that was for some personal reasons. Can you explain and, what that is. Uh, the Bulletproof Diet is, a, um, it's not really a diet so much as, um, to me, when I think of diet, I think of it probably like everyone else does where it's like, I can do this in 30 days and then I'm going to be like jacked. Um, it's a diet in, in so far as it's a lifestyle change. Like most quote unquote diets should be, unless you're cutting weight for like a fear competition, you know, <laughs> it needs to be a lifestyle change, um, to get any kind of benefit from it. But the Bulletproof diet is the, the idea behind it and, and I'm butchering it. Um, but the way that I take it 
the, or what I took from it, um, and this is my perspective as an ADHD and why I still do it, is he's cutting out um, a lot of the toxins that are in our foods, basically because of the way that, that, that they're sourced, the way that they're produced, the way that they're manufactured and shipped and things like that. Um, but the other side of it, the bigger piece of it is that it's a very high fat um, diet and he prioritizes a lot of really, really good fats, um, things like grass fed butter, uh, MCT or coconut oil and avocados. Um, I have like an avocado, at least one every two days and um, prioritizing these things so we can help our body transition from being uh, carb or sugar burners into using fat as our energy source, which is something that our body prefers anyways. So, I, I transitioned to that diet in November um, because I was listening to a, a couple of interviews he did and I was really, you know, picking up what he was putting down. And um, over the two weeks, and, I, and I'm, I'm a pretty lean guy anyways. Um, I, I compete at the 132 weight class. I'm 5'5". Five five, so aesthetics was not really my, um, my, my goal. Um, I don't normally, didn't really have a lot to lose anyways. The first thing that I noticed was my mental clarity and my brain fog um, was gone. And my ability to, to switch on my, my hyper focus when I needed to was it was almost like a switch where if I needed to sit down and do something, I could. Um, and I, and the other I, big I think thing, we just call that focus. I, I think, <laughs> I think they do. We don't. They do. <laughs> Cause, cause you know, I, I actually draw a distinction between focus and hyper-focus. Um, I think, yeah, that, that, I think the hyper-focus, um, while a lot of people call it their superpower, I think it's a short-sighted superpower, uh, because, because it, it drains us, our executive functions at such a higher rate right hyper focus is where you where you do something really longer than you intended to um or where you like you know you ignore all your bodily functions hunger having to go to the bathroom because you're so just like in that zone and there's a difference i think between being in the flow and being hyper focused mm-hmm. and it's a it's a very Agreed. fine line between that but i think that the biggest difference is intentionality yeah and i think we don't have to get down on this tangent, but we could have a really good conversation just all on hyper focus being a superpower. And I completely attribute me be- being able to build a podcast, build two businesses on my ability to hyper focus. And I will say, um, my ability to ignore those things like food was largely due to because I was on the bulletproof diet, is because one of, one of their big tenets is, is to intermittent fast, is to fast well into the day. So I, I ate you just shared that with before. me and I always yeah. like fasting to me is, uh, I don't know, like I'm, I become an irritable a-hole and I don't eat. Um, well, so, so let's define fasting. Okay. Fasting isn't I eat dinner and then I just have water the next day. Um, when I get up, I have my water and then about an hour after I'm awake, I have, um, coffee with a tablespoon of grass fed butter and a tablespoon of, um, like high quality MCT oil and all of those fats like fill me right up. Um, and t- to the point where even though I'm, I'm in the caveat here also is that I'm working out pretty hard. I'm doing, you know, rep maxes, lifting a lot of weight, um, every day. And if that can sustain me doing that, then, you know, the average person who's not really, doesn't have really, um, any competition aspirations will adjust just fine. Um, so I typically will do that. At around 10 30 i'll have another cup of coffee with another tablespoon of of um mct oil and then at 1 1 30 um is when i'll have my first meal and i will tell you that my my productivity between the time that i get home from coaching at, at 10 o'clock to one o'clock is is greater than it ever was on any medication for me asterisk <laughs> for me okay because i can jump into that hyper focus and um and I'm, I'm very, obviously, I work out six to seven days a week. I'm very disciplined. So at one o'clock, I eat. I stop whatever I'm doing and I eat. Um, and that's because time will get away from me, like you said. And I have a, a class to coach at four. And um, it has happened before while I, where I eat my first meal at three and then I have to go coach and then I don't get home until late and I haven't eaten anything all day. And that's no good. So... To the point about about um, this fasting and things like that, I think it, it necessitates that we take the the right steps 
to make ourselves successful. So doing things like learning about the Bulletproof Diet or learning about intermittent fasting and, and how it can work for you. Like what, what, um, is, what, what is the bleed benefit of, of fasting? For, so for me, it's, it's to get that focus. For me, it's at the time when I first started doing the intermittent fasting, it was just enough stress to help me focus of, of just enough kind of like I haven't eaten anything or maybe I'm a little hungry or there's hung, hunger in, in the back of my, my head. And that's just enough to help me focus on what I need to get done. <clears throat> um, I think the overall belief um, of it, according to the Bulletproof Diet, is um, we want to keep ourselves in a state of burning fat. And there have been some studies that show that doing these fasts kind of put our, does put our body in a state of stress and a little low dose of stress is actually really good for our brain and our physiology. And so I'm sure there's other reasons that I, I can't remember, but those are what stand out to me. And that's why I continue to do it. Um, and, and I mean, I just, I just feel better. I notice that when I, when I do eat and then go lift, sometimes I feel a little heavier. Um, not weight wise, but things just feel heavier. Um, I don't feel as light and that's important to me. So it may not, that's, you know, that's not something that your listeners need to worry about probably. Um, but if they can get, you know, four or five hours of productivity of, you know, real productivity because of this, then to me, that's reason enough to do it. What about sugar? I didn't, I, I <laughs> so I, I read, <laughs> I, I I read in um there was it was uh, one of other Rady's books uh Go Wild and I, I had a Go hard wild. time with the book because I felt very extreme. To I me. remember you telling me that yeah um because they were like can't have bananas uh you know like I was like bananas was bananas are like the perfect food <laughs> like, I and but one of the things that 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 the statements in that book that I just haven't let go of it. I think about it a lot is this idea that in probably in 30 years from now, they think that we'll look at sugar. Like we look at cigarettes. A hundred percent. We talk I about hope. that. Yeah. 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 And I, I hope that is the case. So, so here's the, the issue with, with sugar from a, um, it's like a macronutrient perspective. Macronutrient is, you know, the, the nutrients that make up our food. So protein, it's a, protein or carb or fat. So the issue with sugar is that it's a carbohydrate and our body needs to immediately use sugar. That's why some, some runners or some powerlifters will have some candy before they go lift because our body uses it immediately. So unless we're using that sugar immediately to go do a max effort lift, which we're not. <laughs> I was gonna say, wait, are, you, are you telling me that I can eat chocolate at your go lift? That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so here's another thing about that. So before we hit record, I had two pieces of um, extra dark um, chocolate, 88% cacao with uh, cinnamon because we know, and I can't remember why I know this, but I heard it on podcast oh, in the discussion on flow that um, those are two things that help fac facilitate flow. So that's what I had before I, I was here. Um, cinnamon also anti-inflammatory. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, which we could probably get in a conversation that that kind of opens up our blood flow into our brain and allows us to do, um, to think better and more fluid. Um, but to your point about sugar, I would say the easiest thing for your listeners to do is to, to recognize where the sugar is coming from. So yes, we could have an entire conversation about food consumption, but I think a more prudent conversation is, do you really need those Smarties? Do you really need those Sour Patch Kids? kids um and what is that going to do for your performance and i'm not talking about performance in terms of lifting or the gym i'm talking about performance in your day so if if we have in our, our first interview we talked about that i really do think that adhd is a superpower and we need to position ourselves to, to showcase those superpowers if we know that we have that sugar and that's like us ingesting that kryptonite why would we do that? Especially when we know that we need to, to perform, be that at work, be that with our kids, be that during their homework time or, or what have you, you know, why are we going to put ourselves in a position that's going to make us quote unquote um, weaker in this analogy of Superman. So I would, the first step is looking at why we're consuming this food. Um, and that of course begs the question, let's have a conversation around reframing food as fuel and not as 
as a treat or anything like that. We're not, we're not like dogs that get a treat or get rewards. Like we need, let's fuel ourselves. But one of the things that I did want to talk about when we did the pre-interview was that book go wild. And I, I loved that book. It was a great book. None of it was anything that I hadn't heard before, but my takeaway was, yes, this is all I'm on board with all of this, but it is a hundred times harder than he makes it out in the book. Um, and so his idea is purely on the nutrition side of things. I mean, he talks about mindfulness, sleep, exercise, um, and nutrition that go, even for me going to his extremes or, or what he says is ideal is hard. Um, I think about when I started my gym and how I was eating my wife and I, how, how we were setting up our lifestyle and food. And I'm like, I thought that was it. I thought that was the way, like, this is it. I've arrived. And you know, this is a couple of years later and I'm still like, I think, I think this is it, but because I'm continually learning, I'm like, this is not it, but it's, it's good enough for right now because it's better than what I was doing, uh, you know, three years ago. And I think if we can approach our, our everything, our nutrition and our exercise as, is this better than yesterday? Awesome. Then, then take that as a win. And I think where, especially we as ADHD years fail is, we want everything so fast is all right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this bulletproof diet. Um, and there are few people that can go all in and be successful. Fortunately, I'm one of those people where I, I listened to, to Dave Asprey on uh, who's the author of the bulletproof diet, listened to him on a podcast, read his book, uh, finished it on a Friday on a Sunday. I was in the grocery store getting what I needed to get to live this. And that was in October, November. My wife, on the other hand, is still struggling <laughs> with this, this switch to this diet, even though she knows and she'll eat something. And I'm like, 30 minutes later, I'm like, how do you feel? And she's like, I feel like crap. I feel, you know, um, and so it's, it's, it's hard, but I think it's, we need to have a conversation of it, it. And what I'm doing, is that better than yesterday? And if it is, then chalk that up to a win. And what can we do tomorrow? Um, and not beat ourselves up about not going from zero to a hundred. Um, cause that's the surest way to fail for most people. Especially I think with exercise, right? It's like you, you don't exercise for, for, you know, however long. And then you go to the gym and say, all right, I'm here. So I might as well, you know, make my time worth it. And then your body hates you because it hurts. Right. And so like when I'm working with clients, it's like start small, go like, first day just show up at the gym and consider it a victory next day like do five minutes on a machine right five and be done like and if, and if you add just a couple minutes each time you go to the gym your body is not going to feel sore and have the time to to adjust to that and you're going to actually be at a good a good place least in cardio like within like a month right and I think that's, that's one of the hardest things that I have to navigate as a strength coach is the people that come in for their day one and they're like, all right, let's do it. And like, we work for 15 minutes and I'm like, all right, I will see you in two days. If it's, you know, if it's, uh, cause I do classes every other day, I'll see you in two days. And they're like, that's it. I'm done. I'm like, you're done. Like, you don't know you're done, but I know you're done. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get a text that night. And they're like, I am, am my legs are quivering trying to sit on the toilet. <laughs> and I'm like, Aren't you glad I didn't destroy you? Like you thought you needed and that's always hard to navigate is no, I can do more. It's like, you, you probably could do more, but what's the cost benefit here? <laughs> do you want to be able to walk tomorrow or not? I remember a, just a funny story. I, I used to box when I was um, in college and my very first boxing the day that I went to the gym and I had a trainer and he was like, oh, this is what we're going to do. I was there for an hour and a half and I won't bore you with what I did, but I woke up the next morning knowing I was going to be sore. I knew I was going to be sore. I opened my eyes and I'm like, I'm, I'm not sore. Like right on. Like I'm in really good shape. I lift my head off the pillow and pain. I'm talking the most excruciating pain I've ever felt shoots down from the base of my neck to my toes. It took me an hour to get out of bed. <laughs> it took me another 30 minutes to get down the stairs. And I decided to get on a treadmill that I had um, and just get the blood moving. I did that for 45 minutes. And then I walked to the car, I got in the car and I went back and, um, I was just totally destroyed. So I think about that when new people come in and I'm like, I don't want this for you. I don't want you to have to call in sick because you're destroyed. 
Um, so yeah, prudence, um, in what you're doing and take it slow. Um, and you know, I will say if your listeners, um, you know, they're listening to you, they're listening to me, they're invested in their, in their health. And one of the things that I can't say enough and, and, and you'll agree, um, because if your profession is, there's a huge benefit to having a coach, to having a good coach, to having someone that's experienced being able to tell you, look, you're done for the day. Cause I know you, you have to do X, Y, and Z. I know you have to work tomorrow morning, or I know you have on third, you're on sh- third shift today. One of my lifters uh, is an air traffic controller. And I'm like, but girl, you're done. You're going to go get a nap. And then you're going to go work a six hour shift and stay up all night in the middle of the night. You're done. And um, there's huge benefit to having someone that knows you like that. So um, if you were to give like um, a sort of a breakdown of some of the, the most popular diet things that are out there right now, what, what would you, give us a couple of the things that people might want to consider and maybe like a quick reason why. So the big fad right now is the ketogenic diet. And um, explain what that is. is- I'm not, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I think it uh, is. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to make a note and I will send you kind of the, cause I, cause it's like I said, it's a fad. So all the strength podcasts and all the nutrition podcasts that I listen to, there has been a expert on this diet. And the best one that I have found is Mark Sisson. Mark Sisson wrote a book on, on the ketogenic, I think it's called the ketogenic reset. That's that. If I was to do the, the ketogenic diet, that's where I would, I would look at. And I'll send you, I'll send you the, the name of that book. Um, I know anecdotally, but, I've heard people that do that and say they, they just feel their head feels so much more clear. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot, it's, it's cutting down that carbs. And what we know about carbs, especially from the Bulletproof diet and the research that came a little bit before that is carbs cause inflammation. And what we talked about cinnamon a couple of seconds ago is if we, if we're not inflamed, then things kind of flow better in our body. But um, I guess the long and short of it is the ketogenic diet is, um, very little to no carbohydrates. You have, probably have one carb day, I think. Um, and the rest is fats and proteins. I'm sure I'm butchering that, but that's kind of the fad right now. Um, I know that veganism is not making a comeback, but it's kind of gaining traction, um, which for a lifter, I can't, I, I can't recommend it. Um, but there's always caveats. Okay. So I would say the vegan diet isn't going to work. Okay. For, for a lifter, for someone that's exercising really, really hard. However, I watched a guy squat 600 pounds and he was a vegan and it was the easiest. It was looked like I was doing an air squat. It was the easiest thing in the world for him. Um, so what do we really know? So there's that reasons to do, um, a vegan diet. Um, I would say if you're very, very, um, conscious of animal treatment and things like that. Um, and, um, you care about, I don't know, be diplomatic. You, we'll just say you care about the environment and what what that goes. Um, a lot of that Sorry, research. Are you on, saying because I like a good steak that I don't care about the environment? Is that I what you're think, saying, Gabriel? <laughs> I think if, if anyone watched the documentary "What the Health" um, and didn't kind of realize that it was vegan propaganda, um, that a lot of that research that they pulled from that documentary um, was heavily skewed. And if we 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 follow the money, we'll find that it was that research was paid by people that wanted um, that data out there. You know what I mean? But um, if that, even if that's something that you care about because you care about the treatment of animals and things like that, that may be something that you want to do. Of course, I'm going to recommend the, the Bulletproof Diet. That's what I'm on. That's what I'm doing. And I will say that um, I've been doing it since October and I'm, I'm due for another refresher of looking back at that book, reviewing it, and at the very end of it, he has a two-week protocol of this is what you can eat. This is recipes, uh, grocery list, and um, meal plan. And I just need to redo that again and say, okay, now this is baseline now. And now I can kind of tweak it. You know what they need? You know those, those, uh, those meal prep services that are like blue yeah. apron? Like they, uh-huh. need, they need one for someone who wants to kickstart like eating this way. And it's just like for the next two or three weeks, here's everything you need. It's already prepped for you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> take take the thinking out of it. <laughs> right. And I think, I think that's, that's helpful too, is taking the, thing out, the thinking out of it. And I think what you want to look for in a diet is making sure that there is some research backing that it's healthy, but also making sure that there's some guidelines. So at the end of these books, is there a two-week protocol? Is there a 30-day protocol? Um, that way you can have some momentum 
and you can learn the ebbs and flow of this diet. And then when that 30 days is over, can you use what you've learned? And if you can't, then it probably wasn't a good book or a good diet to follow. But if you, so if you can't extrapolate it on your own, then um, maybe it's not the best thing for you because it's, it's not enough to have someone spoon feeding you. You need to know the ins and outs of it. So that would be, yeah, I guess those are kind of my recommendations. I'm trying to think of some other things that, that are, that are out there. I would say if you really just want to be, you don't care about all this, this science and things like that. And you just want to be healthy. I would say, look no further than Mark Sisson. Um, he has another book that um, I usually recommend to, to a lot of my lifters who don't lean either way. And his breakdown of, of how we need to eat, how we need to find our foods, source our foods, where we need to get our foods is really on point. And the guy's like 60 and he's jacked. So he knows what he's talking about. And I think there's also the, uh, the piece of, we, we need to drink more water, right? Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Right? That goes so for, my, my, for, for, for years, my wife is zombie. Like, like you don't drink any water during the day. I, I'm not sure what changed, but over the last couple of months, I just started drinking a lot more water. And I got to tell you, like the, the 3 PM kind of brain fog that would like, that hasn't been happening since I've been drinking a lot more. Like I wake up and I drink probably most of this like 32 ounce uh, bottle of water. Uh, I probably try, I try to go through at least two, but I sometimes go through three or four of these a day. And uh, you know, the, the annoying thing at first is you start peeing a lot, but if you do it a lot, it, your bladder kind of, you know, it, it, it's like lifting weights, I guess you, you <laughs> sure. uh, over time, <laughs> but it does. It, it's a, a really, and, and I've heard too that a, when you are dehydrated, you're, brain is is uh functioning 30 percent less capacity than than it could be and i think that was one of the things that i read that i was like really you know which you know, kind of makes sense right it's kind of like the, it's like the grease and you know the, 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 the years, right so i'm like you know if 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 medication is you know giving you somewhere between a 40 to maybe 60 percent symptom reduction and mm -hmm. water can give you another 30 like bring it on Drink more water. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it also helps you feel full too. Like I, for people who, who tend to like just eat because they're, they're bored or tend to, to um, eat something tastes good. So they keep eating, even though they're full. I'm so guilty of that. Um, uh -huh. like drinking a glass of water before we start eating, like helps you feel full more quickly. Definitely. Good thoughts. Yeah. So um, I think that's, uh, that's it. So, you know, everything we, we've said here today, you can take with a grain of salt. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, but my, my, my say ways are, are awful right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm on like hour two of doing podcast interviews. So um, <laughs> Gabriel, uh, where can people uh, learn more about you? Find out about your, your gym, your therapy practice, your podcast. Can you give them the, the, uh, the information there? The rundown. Um, if you're in Roanoke, Virginia and you want to work out, my website is lostboyssnc.com. Um, you can email me at gabriel at lostboyssnc.com. And if you're interested in, in anything that we talked about, probably a better place, especially if you're coming from an ADHD perspective, is to go to roanokeadhd.com. And you can contact me there and I'm happy to... Um, point you in, in more clear and better directions than maybe we did on the podcast and give you some, some good resources and books to read, or at least some better resources. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving my listeners some food for thought. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Insert grown effect here. Now, <laughs> cue the banjos. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. Learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHD Rewired. Dot com. Support ADHD Rewired and help replenish our coaching group scholarship fund by becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. 
Different levels of support get different perks. You can give just a buck or three or five bucks a month or more. Every little bit helps. And it's an awesome way for you to let me know that you value this show, the community, and everything else we do. That's patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see select interviews and other videos I've made. The ADHD Rewired community is now a secret group on Facebook, so that's one less reason to not just be a passive listener, but to be an active member of our community. Fill out our short screening form at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We screen everyone before they join. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities or on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Quora, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, your family, your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone or even do it for them. And if you really love this episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things you really can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on the Apple Podcast app or on Stitcher or any other podcast app that supports and accepts ratings and reviews. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Need some ideas on where to start other than Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability? Then I would recommend The One Thing by Gary Keeler. Oh, and if you by any chance know Brene Brown, please let her know how grateful I am for all of her work and what she means to me and the ADHD community, and that she's welcome on my show anytime. And in the one in like 7 billion chance that Brene, you're listening, please come and be a guest. Thanks. (laughs) This is Eric Tivers reminding you, keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. And no matter how hard it all feels, Remember, we can do hard things. Until next time.